cell phone here. We got about five minutes left for questions or comments from Mike. Dr. Westra, nope, you got aced out, first guy. Um, Take a long time too, please, if you would. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Burkhard Schultz from University of Maryland. Um, using one approach, the herbicidal approach mainly, is already pretty hard to communicate the pros and cons and how to do it. But now you present uh, another 12 different uh, approaches how to manage uh, uh, weeds. So do you have any ideas uh, what is needed to communicate, to bring the word out? And do you have any new ideas of how to do this? Because I think explaining omics, uh, nanotechnology, and so forth might be uh, a little hard. Agreed. And, and, and your question is, is well founded from the perspective that I think most of us already do a pretty good job of talking about other strategies than just herbicides. The question is why are we not getting people to bite? And, and you know, I've got some opinions, but this is where uh, a, an AFRI grant that we have recently begun that involves a number of our presenters today, we're going to be looking specifically at what are the barriers, why do growers not accept that? Why do they have to wait until they have a train wreck before they go, oh, now what do I do? Okay, what can we do to overcome those barriers? And, and I think, you know, based on, on what I've been hearing at this meeting, we, we have some opportunities to very quickly, quickly in the form of a couple of years, approach better ideas and come forward with some specifics that will make the message more palatable and hopefully get them to adopt those more diverse practices. But, you know, you're right. They, we used to do a lot of this stuff. It was primarily herbicide-based, but with the new genetically engineered technologies, now, what, tw uh, almost 20 years, not quite 20 years adopted, we've, we've lost a lot of that knowledge. That institutional knowledge is gone, and so they know about spraying one herbicide whenever they want. They don't recognize the integration of the other things. Bill Westra, Colorado State University. Uh, you and Dr. Powell's have put forth a number of very intriguing and interesting ideas, uh, tactics that could be useful, to which I think a lot of us are uh, sympathetic. My question to you really deals with where would we come up with the funding to do longer term, multi-year research projects incorporating a number of these tactics to hopefully down the road five or ten years from now have more dependable and predictable methods that growers could depend on. It seems to me that's part of the weakness. We can each do our individual cover crop or seed harvest destructor or beetle studies individually, but how do you put the whole system together in what was called this morning a holistic concept? My approach to that, Phil, is that I don't think that is the kind of information coming from a land-grant university or coming from an industry source, that information isn't going to work. I don't think we can do that. The, you know, we've had some experience looking at large-scale, long-term types of projects, and, and the economics are clear on these, and we've done a lot to publicize those results, but growers, no. I think if this is gonna happen, it has to be community-based, it has to be grower upward, not us downward. And we need to present, these are the tools. Here's what you can do. Pick one from column A and two from column B and make it work because individual farms have individual problems and individual growers have perceptions. So I don't think we can do that. And so I don't know that we need money for the state. Well, strike that. I redact that statement. <laughs> the universities always need money. But for that type of system, I think that has to be grower-based somewhere. Ray. Uh, Ray McAllister with Crop Life America. The, um, scouting of fields is probably the oldest technology we deal with and I, I fully agree that uh, to its importance but it's very expensive it's very time-consuming is it 
amenable to innovation? Innovation, no. Is it perhaps the adoption of, as you a tried and true tactic? I think yes. My question, my response to you would be that, okay, I say scout is, is important, individual field, management is important, but growers have a general sense of fields. And they're scouting at 60 miles an hour with their arm outside of the pickup window. Isn't, it may be good enough for certain fields, but they know the fields that need more attention. And so my sense is that they've got 5,000 acres. They know they've got 250 or 400 acres that need a little love, and they would invest their time in those fields and change it. Uh, but getting them to do that, again, I, I don't know. Yeah, I've got a, a question that's coming from uh, Andrew Price, who's watching the webcast. And, uh, his Hi, question. Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> is strategic tillage is being adopted throughout the U.S. and world to mitigate herbicide resistance to the detriment of conservation tillage systems. How does strategic tillage fit into short-term and much-needed weed control decisions, economics, versus long-term productivity, soil quality, and soil carbon issues? I, I think that's just an absolute wonderful observation. And, and I, I, you know, many, many years ago when I was a, a, a graduate student at Iowa State University and uh, David Staniforth was my major professor, and he suggested that rotational tillage, because he was worried about conservation, he was worried about soil management, rotational tillage on occasion made good sense. And I think strategic tillage, the types of things that, that Stanley Culpepper has been doing down in Georgia, some of the work that has occurred with Jason Norsworthy at the University of Arkansas, certain areas of certain fields need some strategic tillage. When I say cultivate, they think, oh my gosh, I cannot cultivate 5,000 acres. And I said, no, you cultivate the areas that require cultivation. That may be one field, it may be part of a field, it may be only the headlands, I don't know. But strategic tillage is exactly, exactly the type of, of, of tactic that we need to adopt to maximize the benefits of tillage and herbicide resistant weed management and minimize the risks of tillage, including the cost and, and soil conservation. Yes. Okay, we've run out of time, oh. but I want to Use my prerogative to allow two more. Oh, one here and one here. <laughs> Jason, I think you were up first. Okay. You said you'd take it easy on me, Jason. Try to. Please, Please make it brief. Okay. <laughs> Jason Norris no. from the University of Arkansas. <laughs> Mike, I appreciate your comments in terms of scouting. I guess I just want to make a, a comment here. It's not as much a question directed towards you, but when we take a look at these fields again, generally you have four or five driver weeds in those fields and we develop our herbicide or, or weed management programs, not necessarily herbicide programs. You said it right. You I said it right. <laughs> weed management programs uh, centered around that. I guess one concern I have is, is how this is actually being interpreted uh, by, at the farmer level. When you use the word scouting, and again, you showed Dale, Dale Shaner there sitting inside, uh, standing in a field, and that was a 12 inch, 18 inch weed. And I know with myself, I like to talk about again, overlaying residual herbicides, using multiple tactics and not getting into the mindset of seal weed, kill a weed. And I'm afraid that's where we are. And that's being portrayed or being interpreted uh, by some of the audience we're trying to, to work with here. And it comes back to, again, uh, you have failure of a herbicide. Once that herbicide fails, you've got weeds such as Palmer amaranth going two inches, three inches per day. Even if I scout that field, Mike, even if I scout that field, now I have a 12 inch, 18 inch weed, and you name a herbicide that I can spray on that 12, 18 inch weed that is a labeled application. I don't think we can come up with one. Yeah, your so point I, I think we just need to, again, we need to be mindful of that as we move forward and talk about scouting. Yes, I completely value scouting, but basically place it in the right context in terms of the value of it and when we really need to do that. Yeah, your, your point is well taken, Jason, and, and my thought right now is to find the patches of the weeds that we missed and deal with them in those fields. So timing, the timing is absolutely important. Okay, we've got one more right here. Yeah, I guess I would just make the point, um, John Davis, a grower from Ohio. Um, it, it concerns me a little with your statement. You, you, you say shortly, hopefully in two or three years, you know, we'll have some answers is kind of the statement I gathered from you there. Uh, you know, with regard to scouting, you're right. There are some guys with their arm in the window running 60 mile an hour. But yeah, I, I would also argue there's a lot of guys that know exactly where the weeds are and what is going on 
but there's really no answer. You know, you get out in a soybean field where they're above the canopy, you did it in 15 inch rows or seven and a half inch rows, it takes away mechanical. There is no herbicide available at 12 to 18 inches. You know, so scouting may be the answer, but the guys that are out here right now scouting properly and doing what they're supposed to do and finding out from their specialist at Ohio State, yeah, it's resistant. There's no option. There, there's, there's, there's nothing for you to do. The other question would be, is there pipeline things currently available, close to being available, that would fill in that gap short term until the two or three or four years comes up for this management practice to become more useful across the country? John, let me address the, the second question first. And I will say that no, there is nothing in the near term coming out of the herbicide <clears throat> discovery, but I will call upon the industry representatives that are here to say otherwise. There's, a, there's several. Les, anything coming? We've always got something coming. <laughs> Comic relief. <laughs> Harry, what about... What it's a about, question of the timeline. <laughs> in the timeline, he says a couple, three or four years, new mechanisms of action? Unlikely. Thank you. Dr. Streck, is he still here? We find them, but uh, they don't meet the, uh, the hurdles. Okay, so unfortunately, probably not, and that's not, not, it's not good news, John. And, and I think your point is, is well taken. Um, I think that in, in, in the Midwest, and in certain parts of, of the Mississippi Delta, we have sufficient herbicidal tools that if we use them correctly, we can get us down the road. And Jason talked about overlapping uh, pre's and things like that. But the biggest issue that we have right now, and this will be my last statement, is multiple resistances. We have water hemp populations on about 5% of the soybean fields in Iowa that are resistant to five separate herbicide mechanisms of action. And so we have 12, 12 that are available for Iowa. And two of them do not control broadleaf weeds. And the third one that would be very effective is Paraquat. And some reason growers won't use Paraquat in Iowa. So we got, we're down, it's, it's, a, it's a trouble, it's a problem. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And Mike, if you hang in there, you might have a future in this business. I'll try. <laughs> and it's my pleasure now to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Jill Schrader, weed scientist and agronomist at the USDA Office of Pest Management Policy. You don't know how it pleases me to say that. <laughs> New approaches to education and outreach. 